Good morning. You are welcome here. Whoever you are or wherever you are on your life journey, whether you are filled with joy or burdened with sorrow, whether you are straight or gay, young or old, whether you have many friends or you are lonely, you are welcome here. I offer a special welcome to you if you are newly to us this morning. We are honored by your curiosity and presence. We hope that you will stay around for our discussion afterwards. My name is Roy Haynes and I will be your least lay service leader this morning. Kat Barnett will be delivering our message entitled, The World is Better Off Than You Think It Is, with Michael Reason on piano and David Hutnell will be delighting the candles. We have in studio with us Charlie Jacobs, Robert Burnett, and Matt Aspa. And remotely, we have Richard Clark and Colleen Berry and Linda Jackson would be leading our hymn. And with that, let me say, live from Fellowship Hall, welcome to Lake Chapali Unitarian University's Fellowship Sunday service. I always enjoy saying that. We have a few announcements before we get started. The Monday Women's Discussion Group will be at 12 noon Ahi He time. Contact Catherine Loria or Pamela Cosinell for more information. Also, Wednesday, we will have the Community Circle Group, which will be at 11 Ahihi time. The link is shown below. And our third announcement will be Thursday's Women's Coffee Group and chat will be 12 noon Ahihi time. The link is shown below also. If you missed any of that, they will also be on Matt's daily mailings. Now it's time for us to light the chalice with these chalice lighting words by Te Habuga. Why do you go to the forest to search for the divine? God lives in all and abides within you too. As fragrance dwells in the flower, 
or the reflection in a mirror so does the divine dwell inside everything seek therefore in your own heart at this time we invite you to if you have a challenge that you can image image on your camera raise your hand in the chat and we'll enable your camera camera you have to click OK and show your lighting, show you lighting and holding your chalice. We'll give you a few seconds to do that. We're like, what if this is light and so Our hymn this morning is Here We Gather. Linda Jensen has recorded and Michael Reason will be playing it. The, the lyrics will be projected on the screen. Now it's time for our joys and concerns. Each week we take time to remind ourselves that we belong to a community which cares for each other. We do this by sharing any significant joys or sorrows in our life. If you have a joy or sorrow to share today, you can type it into the chat box and we will try to read aloud. We're gonna start with sorrows today. Let us begin by recalling our concerns and sorrows, whether you or the world may be holding. That is in need of healing and caring thoughts. We have one concern that has already been sent to us in email. That concern is from Sue Kelly. Please light a candle in concern for Liz Moser, who has been battling uh, dengue. Do we have any more sorrows? Okay, well, we'll go on to joys. Let us recall the joys, whether you may be celebrated or whatever invokes a feeling of joy and peace in yourself and others. We have two joys that have already been sent to us in email. The first one is from Mardell Harlan. As Fred and I watch all of the anti racist protests around the world, including here in Ottawa, 
we take a moment to celebrate our 56th wedding anniversary and to realize that we still enjoy being together for most of the time. <laughs> and the other joy is from Esther Jones. We have a joy. Our, jar, our daughter, uh, Juliana, and son-in-law, Ren Reiner, have been here for a week uh, to visit and to close on a house they purchased on the outskirts of Chapala. Congratulations. Do we have any more joys? This is from Colleen Barron. My mother seems to have turned a corner in quarantine. She's happy and sassy again, given lots of attention and visits. From Catherine Loria to everyone, we celebrated our 47th wedding anniversary on Tuesday. And this is from Liz. Happy Pride Weekend, even though it's COVID and the protests make it an unusual celebration, still celebrating with our LGBT, LGBTQ community. All right, that's all of our uh, joys. At this time, we'd like to take a uh, time to light our care candle provided by our care team, which represents those sorrows that are too raw, too difficult for us to share aloud. We like this candle for those sorrows which remain present but unspoken. All right, it's time for our offering. Let us tell you how you can contribute to Lake Chapali Unitarian University's fellowship while we are unable to meet together. Here are several ways to donate. And don't worry if you miss any of these, though, they're being Matt's daily email or, um, for you to get. First, you can use PayPal and send your donations to account, uh, to our account. And the web that's listed there. In your bank's pay bill service, you can send money to our U.S. bank account. Contact Susan Miller for further information. Okay? And third, you can drop off or we can pick up any cash in pesos. Contact Lorna Dean and her email is listed there for more information about that. And don't worry, if you didn't get that right, written down, they will be uh, peri periodically shared in the day sharings by Matt. Before we get into the service today, our first reading is by Paul Fryer. We see the world through our lenses, but we rarely do we see more than our mind allows us. Our brain has fixed lens on only to pick up what is familiar and, the, and what is comfortable. In other words, we see as black and white. We see the faults of others we disagree with and are unable to in those that we tend to agree with. Our brain doesn't like to move into the gray areas, determine whether some negative thoughts we hear about someone we support might be true or conversely false about someone we don't. We not too late to look, it is not too late to look close into our own photograph and look carefully at the, what is there. Look at all the corners in the background and in the four shadows. Look at all the colors, the angles, the shapes. Can you open your mind to see more than you thought was there? Or can you imagine what might make the picture even better? After all, it is your lens that determines what you see. Now, Kat Burnett. Morning. I'd like to preface this talk by saying that I will be talking about the whole world in general and not in one or circumstance. We have had some very dire things happen, happening all around the world recently. But I have always thought and still think that there are many reasons for hope. 
When we watch the news, many of us feel overwhelmed and afraid. This was true before we had this coronavirus pandemic to worry about. It's hard to think about making a difference in the world when there seems to be an infinite number of things that are terrible happening and such a tiny number of things that is possible to do to change that. A few months ago, I read a book about what the world is like for people now. The name of the book is Factfulness. It was published in 2018 and written by an international lecturer and world health professor from Sweden, a Dr. Hans Rosling. He filled the book with statistics to show us that we are often ignorant about the basic facts about our world, and we think the world is doing worse than it really is. These statistics are facts, neither positive nor negative, and they were collected and analyzed by reputable organizations such as the World Bank and the United Nations. Today, I'd like to present a little of what Dr. Rosling has to say about the world and about the way we think about it. I'm going to present six of the 13 questions from the beginning of the book. Keep track of how many answers you get right. Question number one. In all low income countries around the world today, how many girls finish primary school? A, 20%, B, 40%, 60%. The answer is C, 60%. Number two, in the last 20 years, the proportion of the world's population living in extreme poverty, that is on less, a dollar a day or less, is A, almost doubled, B, remained about the same, or C, almost halved? And the answer is C, almost halved. Number three, what is the life expectancy in the world today? A, 50, 50 years, B, 60 years, C, 70 years? The answer is C, 70 years. Number four, how many of the world's one-year-old children today have been vaccinated against some disease? A, 20%, B, 40%, 50%, or C, 80%? The answer is C, 80%. Number five, in 1996, tigers, giant pandas, pandas, and black rhinos were all listed as endangered. How many of these three species are more critically endangered today? A, two of them, B, one of them, C, none of them. The answer is C, none of them. Number six, how many people in the world have some access to electricity? A, 20%, B, 50%, C, 80%, the answer is C, 80%. How did you do? Did you get half or more wrong? You are in good company. Most of the thousands of people Dr. Rosling has asked did not get half of them right. I think I got about half of the 13 correct when I was looking at this. Even well-educated people who are interested in these issues get most of these questions wrong. He says, and I quote, every group of people I ask thinks the world is more frightening, more violent, and more hopeless than it really is. In short, more dramatic. Why should this be? Here are some of the reasons Dr. Rosling gives us. The first reason, is an overdramatic worldview. We tend to think about the world in a negative way because of the way our brains worked, work. Negative information sticks better than positive information. You have heard about this here on Sunday before. It's called negative bias and happens because as we evolved, animals that don't notice predators get eaten. We have evolved a terrific appetite for drama and journalists who report only good news would soon get fired 
but dramatic stories are no longer our, our only source of information. Quoting Dr. Rosling, this appetite prevents us from seeing the world as it really is and leads us terribly astray. To combat this bias, Dr. Rosling recommends data therapy. Knowing the facts can bring you more mental peace. Another tendency that human beings have is to divide the world into two often conflicting groups, such as poor or rich or developed and developing with a large gap in between. It might be possible to say something like, people in developed countries have few children and most of them live. And people in developing countries have many children and many of them die. You could say that if it were 1965. The world has changed tremendously since then. Today, in the vast majority of countries, including some of the most populous, China and India, Families are small and child deaths are rare. Thinking of the world in two groups just isn't valid anymore. The world is improving for everyone. Today, 75% of people in the world live in countries of middle income, not poor, not rich. We must stop thinking in this outdated way. Again, data therapy. If you think something is terrible in the world or worse than it used to be, look at the facts. The statistics are not hard to find, it's just that many people do not know them. So, if we're not going to talk about just two groups, rich and poor, what do we talk about now? Dr. Rosling suggests four income levels. Income level one is a dollar a day or less. This is extreme poverty. Human history started with everyone on level one. Level two is $4 a day. With the extra money, you can buy sandals so you don't have to go barefoot, and maybe a gas stove so you don't have to take time every day to find firewood. Level three is $16 a day. No more fetching water, and maybe you can buy a motorcycle to get you, get you to a better job and to a health clinic. And level four, more than $64 a day, which is a little more than $23,000 a year. I think there are very few among us at this fellowship who have less than that. It can take generations for people to move up in income levels. We all have stories about parents or grandparents being somewhere on lower income levels. One of my grandmothers grew up on a cotton farm in Texas. Store-bought anything for that family was a very big deal. And there is no gap. Let me repeat, there is no gap. Even in the world's most unequal countries, most people are living in the middle. There is no extreme gap between the poor and the rich. I don't want to say that we shouldn't worry in inequality. There is still much justice to be gained in this area. I only want to say that the world is not as bad a place as we think it is. And to make the point that we can achieve more peace of mind when we look closely at reality in the world, as opposed to continuing to guess and think in ways that are outdated or wrong. I hope you're inspired to take a little data therapy when you begin to think that the world is a sad or hopeless place. So, and I'm quoting Dr. Rosling again, your most important challenge to developing a fact-based worldview is to realize that most of your first-hand experiences are from level four, and that your second-hand experiences are filtered through mass media, which loves non-representative, extraordinary events and shuns reality. Unquote. I urge you to remember this about the media. You might want to repeat it to yourself before you watch the news. Mass media loves extraordinary events and shuns reality, or that is everyday life for most people. One more human instinct out of those that Dr. Rosling presents is the blame instinct. This is our instinct to find a clear, simple reason for why something bad has happened. 
We need to teach ourselves that whenever something we don't like happens, the reason is almost never clear and simple. We have to look at systems. The sleepy pilot caused the airplane to crash, yes. But why was the pilot sleepy? Could it be a problem with scheduling pilot's work? Could it be that the pilot felt pressured to take on another job because of falling pay? What is going on in the background, in the wider world? Clear and simple is easy for us to understand and almost always wrong. Beware, when answers to complex problems seem clear and simple, think again. Let's punch him in the nose. Let's sue China. No, no. What was involved to influence his actions? What are the elements involved in the jump from animal to human by a virus? How do various cultures and ways of thinking affect these elements? Think again, look at the facts, then think again. Dr. Rosling is not the only person who is telling us that we are wrong about the state of the world. One of the others is Steven Pinker, a Harvard psychologist. He says, and I quote, I don't consider myself optimistic, I consider myself realistic. Most of the data on progress that I cite in my books are just objective facts, but people don't know about them. Not that they haven't taken the right attitude, as in the old expression about seeing the glass half full as opposed to half empty. I try to explain to my readers, even though it's usually something they were not aware of, that the rate of death in warfare has come down. Democracy is vastly more common than it was even 40 years ago. And the rate of death from accidents and homicides is down. It's not a question of being optimistic. These are the facts. We like to think of ourselves as rational, but many, many of our thoughts and actions come from irrational instincts and habits that we developed to get a, give us shortcuts through our complex world. But we do have the capacity to learn the facts and to notice when our instincts are leading us astray. I hope you can use the facts that are available to you to help you feel calmer and less anxious, especially right now when we are all stressed because many of our avenues to reduce stress such as gathering together and touching each other, are greatly reduced. May it be so. Amen. As David comes up to extinguish the chalice, we extinguish the chalice to these words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth of the warmth of community. We keep these in our hearts and share with all the world. Now the prelude will be play, played by Michael, and then I'll have the closing word. Well, actually, I've already played the prelude, Roy, but oh, I'll, I'll, do, I'll No, sorry about that one. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do the postlude instead. <laughs> and I just wanted to say a few words about what I'm going to play. Um, I'm going to play... Uh, the uh, Paul McCartney song, Let It Be. And this is a very positive and uplifting song. And Paul McCartney wrote this for the Beatles' last album, which was also called Let It Be. But the words are interesting because he talks about uh, when I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me. And Mother Mary has often been thought of as being a biblical connection, but in point of fact, it's about his mother, Mary McCartney, who died tragically very young when he was um, uh, an early teenager, when McCartney was an early teenager. But the, the background to this song is that it was around the time that the Beatles were more or less splitting up. And he was worried about what the future held. And he said that his mother Mary came to him in a dream and said, don't worry, everything will be fine. It will all work out. Just let it be. And I've tried to recreate the original uh, recording they did with the guitar solo 
and, and, and everything, and organ and, and brass. And I'm going to play Paul McCartney's part because he played the piano on the recording. And you all know the, the chorus. It's not difficult. Let it be. So sing, sing along. Let it be by the Beatles. Our closing words are by Rebecca Sosnick. Despair, defeatist, cynicism, 
and the amnesia and assumptions from which they often arise have not dispersed, even as the more widely unimaginable, magnificent things hang to pass. There is a lot of evidence to the defense. Progressive, populist, and grassroots constituencies have had many victories. Popular power has continued to be profound force for change, and the change we have undergone, both wonderful and ter uh, terrible, have been astonishing. Please stay around if you would like to for discussion. We will start the small groups in about eight, and can, you can turn on your cameras and unmute yourself. Today's discussion questions are, how did you do with the questions at the beginning of the message? Did some surprise you more than others? And the second part of that is, did you recognize in some of the evolutionary or flawed ways of thinking, how so? Let it be. So this is not work. No, well, the point is, we, what we need to do 